True Crime. I am your host, Dan Marie, and I love true crime. I am your co-host, Mark, and I hate true crime. We'll discuss old and new, solved and unsolved Missouri true crime cases. And sometimes we'll take a road trip or fly around the world to bring you a mystery from other parts of the world. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at Mo True Crime. Please like us and share with your friends. This podcast is not suitable for children. Please use caution when listening around others as the subject matter can be upsetting. Uh, Mr. Bedella, you're sitting here as a man who's going to spend the rest of his life in prison. You've confessed to murder of six young men in this city and crimes that uh, horrified the city and much of the country. You've confessed to, in various degrees, felonious restraint, drugging people, sexually abusing them, torturing them, killing them, dismembering them. And until now, you've uh, refused all interviews. So in light of all those facts, I have to ask you, uh, why are you here? What is it you have to say to us? What is it you want to say about yourself in this case? Well, I've had the media clamoring to get interviews with me. And after I made my last pleas, I wanted to get at least part of my side of it out. I found it very hard to find any way to do that in Kansas City. The media has so biased my case, portraying me as being non-human, and their motivation is no separate from what the way I treated my victims. I treated them as something less than human, it's nothing more than a play toy or not a play object. This is what the media has done to me. It's dehumanized me so that it can believe, along with the public, that things like human sacrifice, set Satanism, demonic practices, are more believable than me being the neighbor next door who reached a point in his life where he could do monstrous acts. That's not the same thing as being a monster. Another report was that you kept detailed torture logs and diaries. Did you? I kept sheets of paper that I had made some notations on. This is between the mattress and springs on my bed. This is one of those packages containing numerous photographs and what became to be known as meticulous methodical diaries. Those pieces of paper in there are these meticulous diaries. These are the pictures of um, the more than 200 photographs, some of them of uh, young men, sexual partners, and these are in some ways, uh, and these that we see here are the, the sheets of paper upon which you made notes. Right. See. This is a copy of one of those pages. It looks like a loose leaf paper. Uh, it does contain information about amounts of uh, drugs and so on. So what is your complaint with the police well, calling these detailed diaries? <laughs> By your evaluation, does this look methodical? It doesn't look methodical. Meticulous? It looks a little sloppy. <laughs> they are not the bound in Corinthian leather written on parchment diaries that the media apparently tries to describe them as. The sheets of paper, their notes. You said, I want the police to explain why they allow the loved ones of families to die in the convenient area of Tenth and McGee. I don't think any family of my victims or anybody else that has been killed down related to Tenth and McGee are going to be happy to find out that their loved one is basically written off by the police as far as investigations go, etc. because they died in a convenient neighborhood. The police knew what was going on, so it's no big deal. And that accounts for your remark to me, and I don't mean at all to make light of it, that I killed six, but they, the police, by allowing this to stay open, they killed more. Yes. This has been something that's been going on for over 20 years, to my knowledge. It seems to me that you're suggesting that had the police done their job, had they followed the leads, had they really been on your case prior to April 2nd, 1988, they would have caught you 
and some of the suffering could have maybe, been prevented. Maybe not caught me, scared me off maybe, prevented things from happening after how, definitely. In a way, do you wish they had? Yes. There was a report in the Sunday Kansas City Star in December about the dangers you might face uh, after you leave the Jas Jackson County Correction Facility and are moved to another larger prison. Uh, how do you feel about reports like that? Do they make you anxious? They give me some reason for concern, but one of the reasons I'm concerned is that these were not just reports. These were digging out quotes from unnamed prosecutors implicate, implying that the inmates down there are waiting to get their hands on me. I am at this point I'm less concerned about the inmates acting on their own as opposed to the inmates or an inmate acting in response to maybe some directive or coercion from some police officers. Do you think you're being set up, perhaps? Well, I think the Star and Times have, since they haven't been able to get a court to put me to death, are now trying to get the inmates to do it for them. So, Emery, where are we this week? Well, we're in Kansas City again. A lot happens in Kansas City. A lot happens in Kansas City. We're talking about Robert Andrew Bordella Jr., who's an American serial killer. He was born on January 31st, 1949 in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. His father was a die setter for Ford Motor Company, and his mother was a homemaker. Bordella had a brother, Daniel, that was seven years younger. The family regularly attended church and were practicing Italian Catholics. Bordella felt that his father liked Daniel better, but his father became abusive to both of the boys and would beat them with a leather strap. Bordella was bullied in childhood. He was extremely nearsighted and had to wear thick glasses. He had a slight speech impediment and had high blood pressure that he had to take medication for daily. Bob was a withdrawn child. He had a stamp and coin collection and wrote to pen pals all around the world. And these pen pals would send him stamps from, you know, where they are from and artifacts and things like that. He knew after reaching puberty that he was homosexual but kept it secret and did attempt in his teens to have a relationship with a girl. Obviously didn't work out. In his mid-teens, he's described as rude and condescending, especially towards women. In 1965, when Bob was 16 years old, his father died of a heart attack at the age of 39 years old. So that's kind of the last we'll hear of his dad. He was 39 when he, had, he died of a heart attack. He was very hurt with the loss of his father, but even more hurt when his mother started dating and remarried within months of his father's death. What was his father like? His father just kind of abusive. He wasn't an alcoholic or he something. He was abusive right? and... They didn't mention anything about the alcoholic or anything, right? No, they didn't mention that he was an alcoholic. So but it doesn't mean he's abusive, right? I mean, no, back no, in it, the day... He was used abusive. To, back in the day, you know, parents used to kind of whip their kids a little bit. I mean, it's not that uncommon. Anyway, I mean, I know everybody looks for, oh, this is the trigger that set this kid off, right? But nothing yet. That's nothing's triggering in my criminal-type <laughs> analytical mind. Okay, well, I didn't even say that, for starters. Well, you brought it up. It was a point that you brought up, that his father beat him sometimes. That was something that he... I guess he didn't know, beat the hell out of him, because he had to came back later. Apparently, he was abusive, or was a disciplinarian with both of his kids, but he preferred the other brother. He did not prefer Bob. Like, he Because he became gay, you think? Well, I don't think he knew that. He wasn't... So why didn't he prefer him? Also in 1965, Bordello was raped by a co-worker in an Ohio restaurant that he was working. And it was raped by another male. He abandoned the Catholic Church well, at He was time. older at this time, though. He was already had this. He was 16. He, so he, puberty's like 12, 13, 14, yeah. right? So he had the male sexual tendencies. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. So do you think, uh, not dive off into this point, do you think that him being in that situation, he allowed... Not loud is the right word. Here we he, go with this rape shit. Okay, okay. I'm, all right, so I'm not saying it's, it's right, but this other guy must have known or something. The way he is described is he has a speech impediment and he has a lisp. So he is probably coming off a little more effeminate than other boys maybe his age. I don't know if that maybe sends out a message to people that, that he's, you know, homosexual 
I don't really have a lot of information, but he was raped, so it was forceful. And did he report it, was, it? He did not. But I think something from that, he, he left the Catholic Church, and he had been a very good student in school, but teachers had said that he was very difficult to teach, and he was not social with his peers and was aloof. At this time, he also saw the movie The Collector, which is based on the book by the same name by John Fowles, a disturbed loner kidnaps a beautiful art student, hoping she will learn to love him. This movie made a lasting impression on, on Bob, which by the way, this movie, what does he rape her? This guy rapes her and stuff. Mm, Yeah. I mean, it's from 1965, so it's kind of G rated, but, is it based on a true people, story? People, if you really think about the story of Beauty and the Beast, it's kind of the same thing. Even though it's Disney and it's all sugary and sweet, he does the same thing. He kidnaps her. Yeah. For I, I mean, never liked the most movie. Beauty I know, but and that, the Beast. if you think about that story, it's kind of demented that he kidnaps her with the hopes of of her falling in love with him. Are you so saying he's Walt not Disney's a beast. demented? No, I'm just saying that that movie is very similar to The Collector. He does the same thing. Like, he kidnaps this woman because he wants her to fall in love with him. Isn't and Walt then... from Missouri? Old Walt Disney? He's from Missouri here, isn't he? Mm-hmm. I think there's a trend going on Kansas here. Kansas City. <laughs> yeah, he's from Kansas City too, isn't he? Yeah, I think he is. Dang, I think we've got them all linked. It's, it's a Kansas but no, City thing. he grew up in Ohio. He's Who? not. Bob is not in Kansas City yet. He's still in Ohio. Okay. He goes to school in Ohio. He graduates from graduates from high school in Ohio. Throughout high school, Bob made excellent grades, and a teacher placed him in an independent study program. In 1967, well, you said that he was aloof and difficult to teach, but, but he yet, made great. He made really good grades. Well, it seemed to me that'd be easy. Well, and a teacher placed him in an independent study program because she thought maybe he would excel more in that than being around people because he wasn't he wasn't social with his peers. Okay. In 1967, Bob graduated from high school. He enrolled in the Kansas City Art Institute and received a partial scholarship. And he his goal was to become a professor. Bob was 18 years old and moved to Kansas City, Missouri to start art school. However, in his second semester, Bob became anti-authoritarian and started to associate with students who supplied him with drugs, which he turned around and sold for a profit. Bob He's also, a hustler. Yeah. Bob also began abusing drugs and alcohol at this time, too. In January of 1968, he was arrested for... So this would have been, like, the second semester of school. Okay. All right. So that was the hippie generation. I mean, you Mm -hmm. fell right into that hippie thing, right? Authoritarian bullcrap and drugs and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In January of 1968, he was arrested for selling amphetamines to an undercover agent. Isn't that meth? No, that's methamphetamine. This is just amphetamines with speed. Speed was like big in the 60s. Methamphetamine is not speed? Meth is not speed? It's considered, I think, a stimulant, but it's not It's not an amphetamine. It's a methamphetamine. It's just a different chemical makeup. Okay. He received a five-year suspended sentence, so he got lucky, basically. A month later in February, he was arrested again for possession of LSD and marijuana. He spent five days in jail. The charges were dropped due to lack of evidence. At 20 years old in 1969, he bought a house at 4315 Charlotte Street in the Hyde Park neighborhood. Of Kansas City. Yes. He's in Kansas so, City. So, yeah. How did he buy a house at 20 well, years old? Well, he's selling drugs. I'm and wondering he had a job. If... Right? He's a short order cook. Do cooks make that much money at 20 and years he's old? He's selling drugs. I don't, yeah, I don't know. But you said the average that... house, we looked it up the other day, the average house is like 30 some thousand, right? Mm-hmm. But I'm wondering if maybe... Could he have possibly gotten like something from his dad, like an like an inheritance type thing? He worked for Ford. Mm. Mm. He was only thirty nine, so I don't know how long he had worked at Ford. But yeah, but they might have still had life insurance and things like that, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know. That there's he, not really. He was in the union, so it probably wasn't too bad. There's probably some benefit there. I don't know. That stood out to me, but nobody really addressed it. So I don't I don't know exactly how he got the money. Um, but he did buy this house. It's just like the other guy with that hundred thousand dollar Mercedes, right? Kansas City. Somehow these people. I know. It's like how are they getting things, all this you know? money? And why can't why can't I do it? Well, you can. That's what you're trying right now. Keep on going. Okay, so you he was still Kansas in City. school at this time. He was still going. He was that still Kansas going City to Arts school. Institute. Yeah, he was still going to school. But his work had started to deteriorate into weird performance art. One piece, he beheaded a live duck and then danced around with the bloody carcass. He also killed a chicken and was experimenting with a dog um, by giving it sedatives. And he would do this as performance art. So people are like, uh, no. The Art Institute decided to part ways with him. 
When so, was this? This was 69. Mm. Um, yeah, but he could have been on a whole bunch of drugs. He could have been LSD and all kinds of stuff, right? He's getting busted for this stuff. Mm-hmm. All the, and, and but I start. I think you start to see at this point that he's got like, kind of like a bloodlust, and he's got this side of him that's very dark. Yeah, with the blood Obviously, and yeah. experimenting with with drugs and animals. And in the seventies, Bob became open about his sexuality. He also became an accomplished chef and worked for well-known restaurants and country clubs. He joined a local chef's association and helped set up training classes for aspiring chefs. He also helped organize local crime prevention and the neighborhood watch in his in his neighborhood. How convenient. It didn't, um, what was the other one that did that? There was another one that did that too. Well, one was a cop. No, that was a Golden State guy. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna get confused. They're all getting mixed up. There, was, yeah. there was somebody else that, that, that like started the neighborhood watch as well. This is yeah, also Yeah, that's right. That's right. There was it was like two times it. ago. Uh Yeah, and and the neighbors they didn't like him or something, right? Or something. No, you're getting It was it was it was a dilapidated kind of neighborhood. They were trying to bring it back. And this one was not that long ago, right? That one and he had some kids and stuff like that. Yeah, he he was on some kind of and he uh-huh. went down to the city hall. Remember he pestered the city hall? Oh, that was Linda Sherman's husband. That was Linda Sherman's husband, you know. Yeah, but skull. wasn't he on some kind of thing to bring the neighborhood back up and Probably. piss a lot of people off and stuff mm-hmm. like that? So this is also the time in the seventies when Bob started renting space at a local flea market where he sold oddities, antiques, and artifacts. In 1981, at 32 years old, Bob quit work as a chef to work full time in his shop called Bob's Bazaar Bazaar inside of the Westport Flea Market, specializing in ethnological curiosities from the world's far corners. That was his little tagline. Anyone that's not familiar with this case, Bob's Bizarre Bazaar comes up a lot. And what he did was he took... Biz- what was that? That was a bird. Oh, it sounded like your throat. And, and it's just a play on words. So it's the two different spellings of bizarre. So that comes up a lot, and I just wanted to... Kind of say that if you're not familiar with the case. The following year in 1982, at 33 years old, Bob had a relationship with an unstable Vietnam veteran. The relationship did not last long. And I'm not even sure why this is constantly brought up, but it is brought up in almost everything you read about him. So there is obviously some impact on him from this relationship. I I think it might have been, you know, he might have gotten heartbroken. So after that relationship, Bob started picking up young male prostitutes He'd become friends with them. He would let them stay with him and they would pay rent by, you know, doing housework or yard work um, because they couldn't, you know, pay the rent. He tried to get them to quit prostituting and to get their lives together and was considered a father figure. And there's neighbors that just thought he was kind of like a, like a foster parent because they would see him bringing these young boys in the house. They didn't really think of it as of anything other than, you know, he's just kind of fostering these kids. I'm sorry if I saw that. <laughs> I would not think that. Well, you're, you're a crime person. And he also looks the part to me of like a creepy like serial killer to me. This to me though, but maybe he did actually know, in you person. You, know, you already know. I mean, you know, you know. You know I'm judgmental with people. <laughs> At 35 years old in 1984, Bordella met Paul Howell, who was bo- he had a booth adjacent to Bob's. So in the same West Westport flea market. He also met his 19-year-old son, Jerry Howell. Bob would give Jerry advice and they became friends. On July 4th, on July 4th, Jerry owed Bob money and over time, Bob didn't think he'd ever pay it back, which angered him. He had the urge to cause pain to someone at this point. Bob went to Jerry's house to take him to a dance contest and in the car, Bob offered Jerry a drink laced with sedatives. He drove around until Jerry no longer knew what was happening. Once in Bob's house, he gave Jerry more sedatives, which were actually animal tranquilizers then bound him to the bed and gagged him. Bob repeatedly sodomized him and took numerous pictures and kept a detailed log. Hal died of asphyxiation. Bob hung him upside down in the basement from the ceiling with a pot underneath to catch the blood. He sliced open the jugular and and made slices in each elbow to drain the blood. He left the body there overnight. The next day, he used a chainsaw and bone knives to cut up the body. Bob put the body parts in black trash bags and then into dog food bags and left it on the curb for the trash men to pick up. His remains were never found. Bob later told investigators that he attempted CPR, but he could not revive him. So that's victim number one. 
On April 10th, 1985, Bob let acquaintance Robert Sheldon stay at his house. Bob was not attracted to Sheldon at all. He injected him with drugs, and the next day Sheldon was complaining of soreness from the drugs, so Bob took him to the doctor. Two days later, on April 12th, Sheldon got drunk, and Bob drugged him with sedatives and tranquilizers, then bound and gagged him. Sheldon was sodomized and tortured for days. Why Why didn't he... He said he didn't like him. Why did he do this to him? He wasn't attracted to him. Because he was... Well, how could you... Because he wanted a, he wanted a slave, like he wanted to capture someone. Yeah, but he sexually assaulted him too. So how, if you're not attracted to somebody, why would you do them? Well, I don't think it really had anything to do about anything to do with doing them. It was the dominance and the control and the torture and the thrill and I think the torture is what actually. Yeah, but for sodomy, you kind of got to get it up. Yeah, and I think it was the torture and the and against turned someone's them on? yeah, and doing oh. it against someone's will. All right, so the first one happened. He's not looking at a relationship with uh, this guy. What what kind of time frame was it between the first and the second one? He was in his thirties when he. It was in nineteen eighty four. The first one. The first one. Mm-hmm. And then when was the second? Eighty five. Oh, April. Right, so. Okay, so like a year or whatever. Eighty five and eighty six is where it really starts to speed up. So it kind of starts. And then it, it just... He's in his mid-30s, right, yes. at this point. Mm-hmm. He started at 35. And up until that point, he's, he never did anything. He would take these boys in, but he right. didn't... Yeah, he didn't... He didn't kill them. Well, we'll learn later he did, actually. He didn't do it to this extent, but he would... Um, a guy, a kid... Well, we'll get to there. We'll get there. Bob stuck needles under his fingernails and bound his wrists with piano wire with the intent of with permanently causing damage to the nerves in his hands to prevent escape. He filled his ears with caulking so he couldn't hear. On April 15th, a worker arrived to work on Bob's roof. And I think he kind of panicked and was afraid, you know, maybe he would, you know, Sheldon would yell out or scream. So he quickly suffocated him with a plastic bag. So, you know, the worker wouldn't hear him. He put Sheldon's body in the bathtub, made incisions for the blood to drain, and then dismembered him and disposed of the parts like he did with Howell in the dog food bags. Except this time, he kept his head and buried it in the backyard. Hmm. He would later dig up the skull and store it in a closet. I think he did that so it would just, you know, decay on its own. And then he would just be able to get the skull. He didn't want to have to do that himself, I guess. Oh, to clean it out. Mm Mm-hmm. That would take some time, wouldn't it? How long does it take for the yeah, a skull would. to decompose? To I mean, I think it cold? would speed up if it's in the ground because there's worms and stuff, you know. Like a year? Maybe. Later in 1985, Bob meets Mark Wallace, who he hires to do some yard work. On June 22nd, Bob found Wallace in his tool shed seeking shelter from a storm. He invited... So this guy was a homeless guy. Possibly. He's a, a male Why would else would somebody go, yeah. I'm gonna go hide out in your shed for a minute? Well, he he knew him too. I mean, he knew, he he knew Bob. He he knew. Oh, Bob. he did. Yeah, he had done w- yard work for him previously, oh. so he knew of the shed. And yeah, he probably knew like this is somewhere I can kind of hang out. Hey, I'm having some problems. Can I just stay in your shed for a little while? No, he didn't ask him. And he just found. He was him just in there. he found him in there. Yeah, so he invited Wallace inside the house and drugged him. Then, like this friend, all right, so the first guy. His son. His son's missing. And he was actually questioned. Because he he knew that he had been... Frequent in his house. Talking or, to Bob yeah. and, and that kind of thing. He was questioned. And we'll get into that too later. But the son wasn't gay. Yeah, he was. Oh, he was? Mm-hmm. All of these men are, except for one is married, but I think he still would like prostitute. He was a male prostitute, but he was married to a woman. Oh, dang. Anyway, so he invited Wallace inside and drugged him. The next day, sodomized and tortured him until he died from asphyxiation. He used the same method as the other two to dispose of the body. Wallace died fairly quickly, as did Sheldon. I mean, they, they, it's like he inflicted so much so quick in such a short amount of time that they died pretty quickly. No, the, well, who's Sheldon? The second one? Mm-hmm. No, the second one, he put a bag over his head. The roofers came. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. On September 26, 1985, Bob picked up another acquaintance from a gay bar and took him back to his house. James Ferris was drugged, bound, and tortured. Ferris was the first victim that Bob intentionally inflicted torture, administering 7,700 volt electrical shocks to the shoulders and testicles for up to five minutes. Bob recorded this in his log as unable to sit up more than 
10 to 15 seconds, followed by very delayed breathing, and finally stopped the project. James Ferris died from asphyxiation. I think he was another one that I don't think he lasted very long through the torture. And he was, which we don't know the ampage, but 7,700 volts Volt. of, of shocks. And I think it might be something he made himself. I don't think it was an actual... He did have dogs, though. He raised Chow Chows. Who Bob did. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering he if He tortured maybe, Dallas? But he oh. started... He did animals or something. In he his, did. He started experimenting the with the drugs the on the dogs. Mm-hmm. And he would take in strays. Yeah, but then he cut a duck's head off and, and dance yeah. around or something. Yeah. But he would he would test out the drugs with the dogs. And uh, in school, he did it in front of, I guess, as performance art. But he also did it on his own, too. And he would take in stray dogs to do just that. You know, right. how much can he give them? On June 17th, 1986, the last one was in September of 85. Now we're in June of 86. Okay. So he ran into a male prostitute he'd known a few years named Todd Stoops. He invited him back to his house for lunch. Stoops and his wife briefly lived with Bob in 1984. So two years prior, he, he'd known this guy a, lot, a, a couple of years. Bob was extremely attracted to Stoops and he was held for two weeks. So he didn't die right away. He was, he was held for two weeks. Stoops was tortured he with... Chained him, chained him up or whatever mm-hmm. in his basement? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Stoops was tortured with electrical shocks through his closed eyes to blind him. He was injected with Drano into his larynx to mute him. And on July Wait, he 7th... Blind him? How'd he blind him? He tried to... He would shock his eyeballs. Like he'd have his eyes closed and he would shock him to blind, try and blind him. So he couldn't like escape. Why didn't you stab his eyes out or something? Well, that could have killed him. Well, I'm, I'm thinking, I see, remember uh, Slumdog Millionaire, what they'd do? They'd put the acid on the teaspoon and then they'd... Oh, we're getting to that. He's, he's not done with these torture methods. I mean, he, he, yeah, he does that. Well, not acid, but... So on July 7th, Bob assumed that Stoops died from a fever and blood loss due to repeated sexual assaults and abuse that he had been forced to endure, which had included the rupture of his anal cavity from Bob's fist. Oh he's, my goodness. Yeah. He disposed of his body the same way as the others. I Wait, how did he die? How did he, he well asphyxiation? These are all from the confessions of Bob, and he thought he had died from a fever and blood loss. Oh. Uh. And he also, with him, I think it might have been with him, he would take ammonia. He would put ammonia on like Q-tips, and he would rub their eyes with ammonia to try and blind them, as mm. well. On June fifth, nineteen eighty-seven, so. Almost an, almost an exact year later, Bob bailed out his friend Larry Pearson. Okay, so this is number five. This is number six. Oh. You sure? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's number six. June 5th, 1987, Bob bailed out his friend Larry Pearson from jail and invited him to live with him. They had originally met at Bob's shop. Pearson had an interest in witchcraft and wizardry. Bob did not intend on capturing him. After Bob bailed him out of jail, he heard Larry and his friends boasting about robbing gay men in Wichita. Starting around June 23rd, Bob started drugging and torturing Pearson in his basement. This went on for six weeks. Bob said that Pearson was his most cooperative victim. Pearson was tortured with electrical shocks, had a broken hand from being beaten with an iron rod, and since Pearson was cooperating, Bob decided to reward him by moving him from the basement to the second floor bedroom. Over the course of weeks, Pearson... Wait, he was cooperating? Mm-hmm. I mean, you think that was, like, real? He really was cooperating? No, I think he was trying to stay alive. Mm. Over the course of weeks, Pearson trained himself to sleep without moving, so he did not antagonize Bob. On August 5th, Pearson bit Bob's penis in an act of desperation while he screamed that he couldn't continue to be treated this way. This infuriated Bob. So this is where there's a couple of differing stories. So it's either at that point, after he bites him, that he's bludgeoned with a tree limb and then suffocated with a bag, or Bob went to the hospital, found out he had, the the hospital told him he had to stay a few days, went back home. How do you explain that to the hospital? Um, he said that someone was giving him moral sex and bit him. <laughs> he didn't tell him that they were locked it's up. freaking embarrassing. I don't know. What did they say? You didn't pay your bill or something? 20 bucks is 20 bucks? You didn't pay the 20 bucks? I don't know. But, <laughs> so we either, after he bit him, got so mad he killed him, or... He went to the hospital, was told he had to stay a few days. Before he stayed a few days, went back, 
and killed him and then went back to the hospital. That's like, there's two different stories there, so I'm not Why sure. Why would you have to stay at the hospital, though? I mean, if you're bleeding now, you're not, they're not going to really want you to go home. Apparently, there back. was quite a big laceration. So maybe they're afraid of infection or something, you know, and wanted to pump them with antibiotics. Yeah, but you don't have to stay for that, do you? You should get some Vaseline or something. And, and This is the 80s. Know. Maybe they didn't know too much about that kind of an injury. I don't well, know. Well, AIDS was really prevalent. I mean, that's when the, like, a big explosion of that in the gay community, right? So either he did it right after it happened or he came back before staying in the hospital. But at some point he did kill him. with He suffocated with him with a bag and a, lig- a ligature. On August 7th. All right, so how did he dispose of him? He returned home and disposed of his body. Like, like oh, the after same. the hospital, came back from yeah. his surgery or whatever. Yeah. The same way, like Robert Sheldon, he kept Pearson's skull and buried it in the backyard. So when he went to go bury it, he used the same hole that he did with, oh, with he did? Sheldon. And he took that skull out, because by that point it was just a skull. Took two of the teeth. I guess the teeth had maybe fallen out or something. And when investigators... Don't fall out, though, do they? Well, there was two teeth they found in envelopes, and they were able to match it to hit oh, the skull. Oh, he took the teeth out because he got pissed. He took his teeth and bit him. Huh. Oh. He might have tortured him. I think of he, that. He probably, I bet when he, when he did that, he took his freaking head, took a pair of pliers, and ripped some teeth out. Ever Maybe. do that to me again? From now on, you're gumming it, buddy. Maybe. I don't know. So, yeah. So, he used the same hole, buried his skull, and then took Robert Sheldon's out of the hole and it's put like it he has this, in a closet. He has this hole in the backyard. It's like fermenting. Okay, I'm getting this one ready. I know. It's just so gross. So on August 29th, 1988, Bob picks up 22-year-old male prostitute Chris Bryson. Bradella clubbed him, raped him, and injected his throat with Drano. For almost a week, Bryson was tortured. He was strapped to a bed, raped morning and night, prodded, poked, and drugged. His eyes were swabbed with ammonia to blind him. On April 2nd, 1988, while Bob was at work, Bryson was able to burn through his restraints with matches that Bob had left in the room. He jumped from a second floor window, breaking a bone in his foot, only wearing a dog collar, and ran to the meter reader walking on the other side of the street, shouting to call the police. When police arrived, they noticed that Bryson had red, swollen eyes, visible scars, and welts across his entire body. He told police that Bob had shown him Polaroids of men who appeared to be deceased and that these individuals and that these were individuals Bob had been unsuccessful at trying to collect as sex slaves. Bob had no intentions of Bryson leaving either. I mean, now today, Bryson's gone. Like he vanished, changed his name, relocated. How did he get out? How did he get loose? What happened? Why? Why? Are you not just fucking listening? <sighs> I was, but now I'm, I'm thinking. How he did he jump? He burned through his restraints and jumped out the damn how did window. How he burn through his restraints? He left matches in there. It was rope. Bob is arrested and refused to allow the police in his house. Police obtain a search warrant and start searching his house at 4315 Charlotte Street. In a second floor bedroom, they find burnt ropes attached to the foot of the bed, an electrical transformer that was plugged into the wall with wires leading to the bed, a metal tray containing syringes, prescription drug bottles, swabs, and eye drops. There was also an iron pipe, rope, and leather belts found around the room. A human skull was found in the closet on the second floor, which that would have been Sheldon's. A partially decomposed human head was found buried in the backyard, which, by the way, there's a picture of that on the website. Is there? It's pretty gross, yeah. Several human vertebrae with hacksaw and knife marks were found in a hallway. Several human teeth were found in envelopes. In the basement, a hacksaw, miter saw, and a chainsaw was found in the basement. The chainsaw was heavily stained with blood and contained flesh and pubic hairs. Luminol tests revealed that the floor of the basement and two plastic trash barrels were heavily bloodstained. A detailed diary was found containing brief entries included electroshock voltage used, drugs administered, as well as sexual positions and reactions methods of punishment, injecting Drano into the voice box, or cocking ears shut in the physical conditions of the victim, if they were awake, snoring, or unresponsive. Over 350 Polaroids were found of his victims. Police also found other torture devices in an extensive library of witchcraft and the occult, including a satanic ritual robe. Restraint and sexual devices pornographic literature, hypodermic needles, and a book devoted to the creation and remedies of narcotics. The weekend that Bob was arrested, Kansas City was hosting the Final Four tournament. Bob displayed four human skulls, most likely fake, 
in the window of Bob's Bazaar Bazaar at Westport Flea Market with a sign that read the final four. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of blatant about his. Well, I think it's those people they want to get caught. I mean, they want to see if they can get away, you know, what they can do. Mm-hmm. Little games. After Bob's. Wait, these are real heads or something in his store? No, they think that they were fake. Uh. That they weren't real. Yeah. After Bob's arrest, he was only charged with sodomy, felonious restraint, and first-degree assault with a $500,000 bond. However, his bond was revoked after an officer testified that the men in the Polaroids appeared to be dead. So you have to remember, when he was first arrested, it was just Chris Bryson that had escaped. They didn't. Right. They had no idea about these other victims. And so this Chris Bryson is just telling them, like, this guy has Polaroids he showed me. You know, I don't think he was going to let me leave this house ever. Like, he was going to kill me. And so it wasn't until they started investigating and finding these things that they started upping the charges. So yeah, first, but that must have been within like a week or something. I think it was, I, I don't think it was quick, but I don't think it was, yeah, I don't think it was like weeks or anything like that. Especially since they, when, once they found the head, that partially decomposed head. But right? that was all kind of after the fact. That was when they started investigating and... Yeah, when they found the skull in the house, I think that's when they realized, like, we need to dig up the backyard. There might be some some bodies buried. Once the word got out that Bob's of Bob's arrest, people speculated that Bob was cooking and serving his victims at as food at his shop. And he mentions in that interview that they got sick of the food there, and they would bring in the the booth, the people that had booths. They would bring in like the kind of have like a potluck, and Bob would bring in food. And now these people are thinking, oh my gosh, did he bring in like? <laughs> Was the meat human meat? Yeah. But there's no evidence of it, and Bob has denied it. You know, he denied that he ever did that. Bob has cited the 1965 film, The Collector, based on, you know, the book by John Fowles, as his inspiration to the murders, which Bob called, quote, my darkest fantasies becoming my reality. A local radio personality wrote a song parody called They Call Me Bob Berdella to the tune of the 1966 Donovan hit Mellow Yellow. So, like... They call me Bob Barrella. Isn't Mellow Yellow a soda? It's that song. Haven't you heard that song? I have not heard that song. Yes, you have. No. They call him Mellow Yellow. No, I have never heard that song. You've heard that song. No, I haven't. I don't want to hear it now. You have to show me later. They So they played that song on local radio stations, which also gave out prizes to listeners who attended events wearing dog collars, which that is just so distasteful. So what's the dog collars? You said this before. He ha- he had them. They were all wearing dog collars, and they were literal oh, dog and collars. Pictures they like, be. there's pictures on the website because some people. Well, wasn't that a, a kinky thing? That, no, they were. They're. I'm not I talking know, about like the gothic, like, like kind of S and M, like with the. Stuff. No, I'm talking like a literal yeah. dog collar for dogs that you would like. One of them I think is blue. I mean, they're not the actual dog collars that people into that would, right. you know, use. There is a website out there that sells murderabilia, and they have a lot of this stuff that he owned. Dog, two dog collars being one of those items for sale. That were actually his. Yes, and I'll tell do you, you. Where do you buy this stuff? How do you get this stuff? I mean, isn't this in evidence? There's a. It was evidence. Yeah. Well, how long do they hold evidence for? I guess until it's solved. They don't hold it any longer. What if you want to go back to that case? I mean, what if they appeal it or something or there's a lawsuit on it? Yeah, the evidence is gone. But the thing is, is that this is for sale right now on a website, which I completely disapprove of because I just don't. I, first of all, who? why would you want to own that stuff? That's like bad juju. Second of all, maybe they need it why for would their you want to? Hmm? Maybe they need it for their dog. I doubt that very much so. People buy all kinds of weird stuff. Placentas and crap or something, right? I don't think they buy placentas. Well, don't they buy... There's, there's a market for all that weird stuff. And as you heard in the interview with Bob, he disapproved of the song and the media coverage of the murders, claiming the media dehumanized him. Bob considered himself to be the neighbor next door who reached a point in his life where he could do monstrous acts. That's not the same thing as being a monster. The Westport Flea Market has no sign of Bob's Bizarre Bizarre, but most locals can point it out. On July 2nd, 1988, a grand jury indicts Bob for the murders of Larry Pearson. To avoid the death penalty, Bob pleads guilty. On September 2nd, a grand jury indicts Bob for the murder of Robert Sheldon. Bob plea bargains life in prison for a full confession of his crimes, all of his crimes, and to keep his house, which, you know, they agree. To keep his house? Why does he want to keep his house? If he's getting life in prison, why does he want to keep his house? You'll find out. 
Police were stay tasked tuned. to find. I gotta stay tuned. Yeah, you that. gotta stay tuned because you don't know the story, obviously. Police were tasked to find the men in the Polaroids. So there's only you know over 350 Polaroids, and they weren't all of people that he killed. There was other people in these Polaroids. So one man, Freddie Kellogg, had lodged with Bob and helped him persuade men to party at his house so he could drug them and assault them. Kellogg said numerous male prostitutes and addicts didn't want to be in contact with Bob because of his links to the 1984 disappearance of Jerry Howell. So when Jerry went missing, Bob Wait, was one of the... so they knew this. They, he was one of the suspects. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he was an actual suspect. But they knew that. But, but these he other, was these interviewed. Other, he was these, interviewed. These male prostitutes kind of knew. Yeah, they knew. They knew that he was interviewed and possibly had something to do with it, but... Being interviewed about a murder and being a suspect is different. And I don't see that he was a suspect. He was just someone they you interviewed. Don't think, you don't think if you're getting interviewed, you're a potential suspect? Mm-mm. What? They interview everybody. They interview anybody that knew them or family, you know. No, just because you get interviewed doesn't mean you're a suspect. Well, they must have thought something. And people knew that, you know. It was I mean, like there could have been the other pro- male prostitutes on the street mm-hmm. and they're interviewing them. Freddie knew this. You know, he knew that he had been interviewed and he knew why he wanted so these people the to come hang out with him. It was to drug and assault them. Like he knew so he, at that time and, you know, he didn't, he didn't do anything. Wasn't that an accomplice? If you he do wasn't that, killing anybody at that time. You're helping. It's like driving the getaway car. I know. I agree. No, he, there was no charges or anything. So Kellogg was able to identify Todd Stoops, Robert Sheldon, and Larry Pearson in the Polaroids. In June of 1987, Bob had filed an assault report from a hospital room in which he alleged a man named Larry Pearson had deeply bitten his penis during oral sex, causing a serious laceration. So not only did he have this dude tied up and was torturing him, he also filed an assault charge on him. He filed an assault charge because... But he knew at that point when he he filed the assault charge that he was dead. He was dead at that point. So they didn't look to him to be the primary suspect. Well, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking he did that. So it would never look like he right. had anything to do with the disappearance. Right. That, oh, I filed this assault charge. Now the dude's missing. You know, he took off because he did this. You could look at that. Uh, you could look at that another way though too. Like he was just so mad that he did that that it was almost like his killing was justified. You know. I'm sure. Yeah. Robert Sheldon's skull was identified through dental dental records as well as Pearson's. He had actually been a ward of the state, so they had they had his dental records. From December 13th to the 15th, and we're still in 1988, Bob confesses to investigators his crimes in great detail, which was part of the plea bargain. On December 19th, 1988, Bob pled guilty to first-degree murder in the death of Robert Sheldon and four counts of second-degree murder involving male victims. Bob confesses in court and is sent to the Missouri State Penitentiary in Jefferson City. He also announces that he has set up a trust fund in the amount of $50,000 for the families of the victims. Bob also facilitated an auction from jail of his collections that were in his house and I guess his shop, and he raised another $60,000. Bob admitted in testimony that once he chose to capture his victims, he had lost any degree of humanity in his eyes. With the exception of Mark Wallace, who was purely opportunity, he was the one hiding in the shed. Right. So he had no intentions of ever capturing him. Bob captured the other five victims after he had been unable to steer them away from their lifestyles and had become frustrated at the failure of his attempts. Bob told investigators he tried to prevent malnutrition or infection by giving the victims antibiotics or nutrients intravenously. Oh, this is a nice guy. I know, right? In January of 1992, Todd Stoops' mother wins a wrongful death suit against Bob and is awarded, wait for it, a record $5 billion. Bob can't pay this, obviously. He cannot pay this amount, but Stoops' mother would have claim on any future earnings that he might make. Uh Bob died of a heart attack at 43 years old on October 8, 1992. On the day of his death, Bob complained to prison guards that he had chest pains. He was immediately taken to the prison infirmary where it was determined that his heart was not stable. An ambulance transported Bordella to a hospital in Columbia where he was pronounced dead at 3.55 p.m. When the judge at his trial was informed of his death, his sarcastic response was, Couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. (laughs) Bob had complained and wrote letters that prison officials were not giving him his heart medicine. I remember he had to take this as a kid. For high blood pressure. Right. Rumors are that Bob was poisoned, but no official investigation was conducted. Also, if you remember, his dad died of a heart attack at 39 years old. Mm. And he had high blood pressure as a kid, so I think it was probably natural. 
Published reports cited that Bob suffered from depressive personality disorder and was diagnosed a sexual sadist. He never showed any remorse for his victims. Bob described his victims as play toys and blamed his murders on police not stopping him sooner. People have described Bardella as an egotistical jerk, a know-it-all, a pompous asshole, a misogynist, and that he smelled weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. After his death, a local multimillionaire and former bank robber, Del Dunmeyer, bought Bardella's house. He kept some items from the inside and had the house raised, but before that he had a thorough search of the backyard for any other, you know, human remains. Dunmeyer then gave the deed of the property to the Neighborhood Association. In October of 2016, someone created a Bob's Bizarre Bizarre page on Facebook and posted that they will be reopening the shop. And this is a quote. Nearly 30 years after BBB closed up shop, we have decided to reopen. Despite the horrible circumstances behind our uncle slash brother's arrest, we can no longer let the past affect our family business. The owner of the Westport flea market was interviewed and believes it was a hoax. And there's some really awful messages on there. I mean, there's there's vi actually victims' family members. Um, one of the women, I forget which one, but was James Ferris, his wife, I think. Mm -hmm. I think it was Ferris. Yeah. His wife makes a comment on there. Oh, yeah. His actual wife. Yeah. That's where we went. Right. It's a the restaurant Westport. now. Mm -hmm. It was a restaurant then, but it was more flea market than restaurant. And uh. I think now it's more restaurant than flea market. Right. So there's some additional resources to check out. There's a 2004 documentary, and I, I don't even like to call it a documentary because it's made by Trauma. And I think it's a big, it's called Bizarre Bizarre, and I think it's a pile of shit. It, the music is horrible. There may or may not have been an interview with the real Chris Bryson. I'm not even sure because it seems somewhat staged, but they have a person kind of sitting on these stairs and they're blacked out. You know, you can't see their face and you can, right. but you can just hear their voice. And in parts of it, I kind of believe it, but then other parts I'm like, it seems kind of rehearsed. So I don't really know because this film has real people that are interviewed, but then they have their own quote unquote actors acting out some things and it's just it's just really horrible james elroy is mixed throughout it as well there's also a book called rites of burial by tom jackman and interestingly enough there's a person called christopher wilder he was a spree killer he was killed by police in 1984 and on his person like in his possession was the book the collector also leonard lake and charles ing also liked the book the collector um, they were a pair of serial killers and rapists and abductors. So you think anybody that reads this book is going to be a serial rapist or killer, serial killer? No, I, I think it's just had a lot of inspiration to people of not sound, you know, mind. Hmm. So I was just going to tell you about Leonard Lake and Charles Ng, if you don't know about them. Um, they were a pair of serial killers, rapists, and abductors believed to be responsible for as many as 25 murders. On June 2nd, 1985, Ng was caught shoplifting in a hardware store in South San Francisco and fled the scene. Lake, who was with him, was arrested in the car outside the store when a 22 revolver illegally fitted with a, a suppressor, bullet holes, and blood stains were found inside the car. Lake identified himself as Robert Stapley, one of his and Ng's victims, and showed an altered driver's license, which had belonged to the actual Stapley, because the license listed Stapley's age as 26 and Lake was clearly older. The authorities became suspicious and arrested him. When he handed a glass of water and left alone, he swallowed a cyanide pill sewn into a secret compartment of his clothing and slipped into a coma. He was put on life support but died after four days. Prior to killing himself, he wrote a suicide note revealing his and Ng's real names and confessing to their crimes. When the ranch was searched by the police, they found 12 corpses buried in shallow graves on the property, as well as a bunker, a stash of weapons, and a total of 45 pounds of charred bone fragments, leading the investigators to believe that the pair may have killed as many as 25 people. In the master bedroom, there was a four-post bed with loose restraints tied to each post and bloody pieces of women's lingerie. The searchers also found Lake's diaries and journals, as well as, a vid as well as video recordings of him and Ng raping and torturing their victims, and of Lake alone talking about holding a woman captive as a sexual slave and servant after the world was destroyed by our nuclear war. The bunker had two hidden rooms. First, the torture chamber, which contained various tools and a sign that read the Miranda, a reference to the name of Lake's plan, Operation Miranda, a reference to the novel The Collector by John Fowles, in which the protagonist abducts a woman named Miranda and holds her captive in his basement. The other room was a small soundproof cell with a bed, a table, and, chemi and a chemical commode. Two people that were inspired by The Collector as well. Hmm. 
So in all in all, he had six victims. Jerry Howe, 19 years old. Robert Sheldon, 23 years old. Mark Wallace, 20 years old. James Ferris, 20 years old. Todd Stoops, 21 years old. And Larry Pearson, that was 20 years old. And didn't really suffer at all. Be good. And if you can't be good, be careful. Stay safe out there.